Shalom, Shalom, Chavarim, and welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry with myself, Aliyah. And it is so, so good to be with you all today because I am really, really happy that we can spend this time together and that we can be learning about someone that is just so significant and someone that I actually hear quite a lot about from many different women when they say, well, you know, who inspires you in the Bible? And which female do you look up to in the scriptures? And, you know, there are basically maybe three or four that are commonly commonly called on and so Deborah she is actually one of those women who a lot of people look to for leadership examples and also just being a role model and also just being someone who was just so brave and strong and bold and whom Yahweh used to just really really do incredible things in the days of the judges and so that's right this teaching is all about Deborah prophet judge and mother and you know what in all aspects we need to realize that the book of judges is really a historical book and that's one of the things that we have to just say and you know come to to kind of grips with right at the very very beginning because of course it details the spiritual realities of how Yahweh dealt with these people Israel as they just continually rebelled against him and then it also details historical events and these are the events that you know archaeologists and historians have been looking at for you know centuries and trying to to discover where it took place sometimes you know what the dates were what was really happening and so Judges is a beautiful historical book and if you are interested in history it's so beautiful just to read through it and to look at it as a historical book. Now we also know that really the context is that you know the Israelites they were redeemed from this harsh and this wicked oppression. They left Egypt, they were victorious under the leadership of both Moses and Aaron at that stage and then they wandered into the wilderness and they were gifted with the priesthood and they were gifted with the righteous leadership of Joshua, the one who led them to cross the border into the land of Canaan and take possession of the land that was promised to their ancestors. And so they had all these leaders and they flourish underneath these leaders. And of course, we know that, you know, obviously there were people that were still doing wicked things and still doing bad things in those times. But while they had these righteous leaders, and I will include Miriam in there because it actually speaks about Miriam and Aaron and Moses as being those three powerful leaders in the time of the wilderness they were people that were really really being the righteous leaders that Yahweh wanted them to be and they helped lead the nation and you know what the truth of the matter was though that they crossed the border of the Jordan River and they went into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua and then you know Joshua was their judge for so so many many decades but then afterwards when he passes away this reality set in with Israel when they lacked this leadership of righteous godly men and women then they just ultimately settled into the land where they were living that was so filled with wickedness and idolatry well they settled into the very very same sins of those nations and of those people groups and tribes that they were not to partake in their wickedness of and that's the reality you know these very nations they sacrificed their children to pagan gods they worshipped at bad altars and their evil had really really defiled the land and that was why Yahweh said that the judgment for those nations was so high that he was going to use Israel to overcome that. But instead of being this, you know, light that they needed to be in that holy calling that they had, there was really, really, they were just torn by the cultural realities of their day. They weren't impacting the culture they just became assimilated with the culture that was really really there and they partook in all those perversities and that is really what Israel did and they were a called out nation and they were just so supposed to be that light but yet they were swept up in idolatry they sagged into being an evil nation that was just overtaken by darkness and this is what we see when we look at the book of Judges as a whole the context of it is that you know they are called to be a light they're called to live in a land promised to them a land that they are given freely of course they had to go and they had to war and they had to take it that was part of their faith journey that they had to walk but Yahweh really led them into a place where you know like he says in his word that you're going to eat from vineyards that you didn't plant you're going to eat things that you actually didn't sow the seed for that's grace that's mercy that's blessing that's abundance and they had that given to them and yet they just sagged into darkness and they just 
allowed the wicked culture, the messages of the culture of their day, the practices of the culture of their day to just completely overcome them. And that's a huge lesson for us, not to allow the culture of our day to overtake us, to dictate how we interpret our Bible, to dictate what is truth from the very beginning. If Yahweh says this is wrong, then that is wrong. It's, it's not a matter of, well, it could be, or maybe it's not, or our culture has changed. We need to be relevant. It's got nothing to do with that. We have to be the light that we are called to be, and we have to impact the culture and not allow the culture to impact us. So this is how Israel failed. Really, you know, they failed. They sagged into dark times within themselves and also within the land that they were living in. And so yet, you know, just like it is today, somewhere inside of themselves, they knew that God's love, his kindness, and his mercy could be bestowed upon them. And it's just like that today when people are going through hard times, it's easy to pray and it's easy to maybe go to a church or a congregation or a fellowship and it's easy to find that, you know, sort of, I really need that help within myself. And that is what the Israelites did. And you know what? That's according to our Abba Father's loving, kind nature. He just comes in every time when they cry out to their covenant God because he was their covenant God right from the beginning. And so every time that they were oppressed by new nations that were oppressing them or taskmasters, they really, really cried out to Yahweh and he came through for them. His mercy was truly new every single morning. And the redemption came through God-ordained leadership. That's also a lesson for us. And it came in the form of a judge who defeated the enemies of Israel and then restored a time or a form of law and peace and that's really the context of the book of judges now i'm very very big about studying the bible it is something that i think is so incredibly significant to my life it is what i want to use all my time to do and so i'm very very big about understanding the context of the book that you're reading so i've set this up as that's a little bit of the context before we really dive into deborah who is obviously a study subject for today and someone whose life is really going to challenge and inspire And so that is really, really the climate of the book of Judges overall. But now what is the particular social climate? And this is where it gets so fascinating and so interesting. So Deborah is around at the time of the 13th century BC. And so this is the time period where Deborah is alive or Devorah is alive. And she is there during this time period. Now Judges 4, 1 to 3 tells us the context of her time. It sets the social climate tone of what actually happened happening in Israel in this particular area at this particular time and it says again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of Yahweh now that Ehud was dead and that was their previous judge so Yahweh sold them into the hands of Jabin king of Canaan who reigned in Hazor Sisera the commander of his army was based in Harashet Hagoim because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and he had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years they cried out to Yahweh for help this sets the tone right here. Why what we're looking at at this 13th century BC, right at this time, is the Israelites again are doing exactly what we said. From the beginning of the story, this tone is set. The children of Israel, they were on the straight and narrow. Yet again, the same pattern, yet one of their leaders, Ehud, he dies and they resorted to sin once again. So for two decades, it says here in Judges 4, the tribes were oppressed by a cruel king whose army believed in might and brute force. And in fact, the words that are used here in Judges 4, the words that are used for cruelly oppressed, Pressed. It actually means in the original, in the original Hebrew, it means prevailing power of force and oppression. So that is a heavy hand. We have Sisera, who is the commander of the army, and he's a very, very cruel soldier. He's a general that has 900 chariots of pure iron. No army could overcome his war machine. That was intense during those days. And only a miracle could accomplish this overcoming of Sisera's army, of his 900 chariots of iron, as well as the soldiers that he would have at his command who were riding on those chariots, which is quite something. No army could overcome this and only a miracle could 
help Israel be delivered from this cruel oppression that they were facing. And that was what they knew. And this fact really, really led them onto their knees desperately. And you know what? Interestingly enough, this is what's so interesting about Judges. Uh, It's actually in Judges 5 where we get a fuller glance of the social climate that Deborah is going to find herself in, that the Israelites are going to find themselves in. We get a fuller glance actually in Deborah's song, which comes later about how things were verses six and seven of Judges five. It tells us that in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted, and the travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased; it ceased in Israel. And that is the song that Deborah sings, and that is what she says, and she tells us so much about what's actually happening. You know what? The streets had become places of danger. The villages they were deserted; they were unoccupied. And lawlessness, cruelty, and violence were the order of the day. Life in all its simplicity had actually vanished. It was no more. No one was safe. Everybody suffered. And we recognize these similar symptoms even today. When vicious dictators rule, when we are cruelly oppressed both in the natural and in the spiritual, this is what happens to us. We do not have a sense of peace. We do not have a sense that our life is free and that we can enjoy freedom as it's enjoyed in other places. And this is really what's happening. And so Deborah sets this tone. She tells us that this is really what's happening. She tells us this in Judges 5. So imagine it, you know, villages were deserted. Places were unoccupied. People didn't walk from village to village because it was unsafe. There was no trading that was taking place. There was no markets that were open because there were big markets at this time and people were trade and they would do things all of that really really ceased people kept into themselves kept into their homes and really they were overcome with this cruel oppression and this cruel force of Sisera the commander of the army the general and so let us turn to Deborah herself because like I said the purpose of our study our study subject for today is to really examine Deborah as she really was and so Judges 4, 4 to 5 says the following, now Deborah a prophetess the wife of Lapidot was judging Israel that time and she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment now you've probably read that scripture many many times and takes off exactly what you see in in that scripture now you know we see Deborah we see her here mentioned in a few different ways she's actually mentioned as three specific things three specific titles if you will it's the woman we have the prophetess and we have this mother of Israel and like I said therein will be our focus it's not the specifics of the song as I mentioned earlier in Judges 5 or of the battle itself it's Deborah this her life is just an encouragement her life is an inspiration her life her legacy her leadership like I started off saying it's a model to women today and we do we look to her as a model of bravery of fire female leadership and she really really embodied those roles so very well so here we have as I say Deborah introduced to us through three titles here specifically in Judges 4 45 we have prophetess Lapidot's wife and we have judge these are the three things that the writer of judges is telling us about deborah herself so now we need to realize that her very first calling and description is actually that of prophetess so she is a mouthpiece for yahweh's will she is his spokesperson the person that's speaking now for the ever father and she receives divine inspiration she receives messages from the almighty she shares his will with the nation that's so powerful that she has this office of prophet and prophetess, which is mentioned as one of the fivefold ministry offices in Ephesians chapter 4. Now, throughout the scriptures, women actually operate freely within this role of prophet and prophetess. In the Old Testament, we had Huldah, who is amazing. We have Miriam. We have Noah Dea, mentioned in Nehemiah 6.14. Noah Dea was actually an evil prophetess. And I actually did a study of her, and she wasn't a good woman, but she was still a prophetess. And then we also have in the New Testament, we have Anna, the prophetess in Luke 2, who prophesies over Messiah Yeshua. And then we also have Philip's daughters, who are well described in the earliest congregations 
Acts 21 verse 9 as women who are prophesying as prophetesses. And it's so beautiful because women, you know, really, really function freely in this office. And that should really speak to us. I'm just going to pause and say that it should really speak to us again right now where we are at. We have this reality that's happening in the body where many, many different leaders are standing up and pointing fingers against female leadership and against women and saying that they can't serve. And we have all of these women that were serving in these fivefold ministry offices throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see them, we just have to find them, we have to celebrate them, we have to preach them, and we have to know their stories well. So that when people come and say that you can't do that and you are called to that place, that you can say, you know what, this is what this is what Yeshua has called me to do. I don't surrender my life to any human. I surrender my life to him and I'm going to do what he calls me to do. And you know what? Deborah's first calling, her first description is that of prophetess. She is a mouthpiece for Yahweh. She is speaking his divine will. And you know what? She is one of the only individuals in the Bible who are called both prophet and judge. Like I said, you know, here she's mentioned in Judges 4 as being prophetess, Lapidot's wife and judge. And she is one of the only people called both prophet and judge. You will be so, so overwhelmed, I'm hoping, to know that there's only two people in the Bible who are called this. One is Deborah and the other one is Samuel. And now Samuel, we know, was an amazing man of God. And the Talmud actually states that Samuel, in fact, wrote the book of Judges. That's what the Jewish people believe. And that it was edited by Gad and Nathan, who were two other prophets at a later stage. Now, if Samuel did write the book of Judges, it would be remarkable to know that he was not intimidated at all by Deborah and by the fact that she fulfilled the exact same roles that he did and she had the same offices that he did and if he was the one who wrote this he wrote it exactly like that and even if Samuel was not the author of the book of Judges it still remains that Deborah and Samuel were called by Yahweh to be both mouthpiece and leader over his chosen people because with God there is no discrimination there is only calling and our part the role that we need to play in this is that we have to surrender that is what's required of us we have to surrender 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 to what to the calling that he has on your life You have to be obedient to that. Regardless of anything else, you have to be obedient to Abba Father. And that is what he has called us to do. Now, if we make an anagram with her name, that means that we mix up some of the letters of her name. And it's very common to do this. If we make an anagram with her name by mixing the Hebrew letters together, we actually get the word Deborah, which actually means to speak. And her very, very essence, I believe, her very, very inner being and a very very deep calling and very very specifically Deborah was called to speak her voice was a gift a gift from the almighty a gift to the people no one expected her to shrink back no one expected her to be silent Deborah was loved for her role as prophetess and the people recognized her authority and looked to her for guidance and leadership because just now I'm going to show you from the scriptures how it said that the people came up to her for judgment that is what it was about the people were not intimidated by her there was nobody men and women they came to her for her leadership for her role as prophetess and judge and she would sit there under the palm tree and she would decide divine cases Deborah judged the people and now the word for judged in the original is shafat and it actually means or which means that she provided all functions of government. There was no distinctions back in the day between civil functions and religious instructions in ancient Israel. This just wasn't a reality. If you did, you know, if you were called to be judge, you were both civil and religious. You know, today, of course, it's not like that, but that's how it was in ancient Israel. And in this verse of Judges chapter 4, which I read to you earlier on, the word judge is actually used in the continued action participle, which means it was a continual action. Deborah judged 
always. That was what she did. It wasn't it wasn't like she judged once upon a time or she judged once. Or you know, she judged every now and then. It was a continued action. Every day she woke up, every day that was a calling, always. She's seen in this role and the people, like I said, have no problem coming up to her for sound judgment and for decision making on matters that required attention. Judges were in charge of the law, like I said, and they were in charge of law and order before the nation would eventually be ruled by various kings. That is really actually very, very important for us to note, because like I said earlier on, you know, whenever there's this righteous, godly leadership that's happening, even from the time of the Exodus, we see that the people flourish under this kind of leadership. People always need leadership. Yahweh's people need godly, righteous leaders called by Abba Father. And Deborah embodied that. She was a righteous leader called in that generation in the 13th century BC. At that time, at that place, people came to, they recognized that. And this is how it would be in the book of Judges. This is how it would be in the time of the judges, including Samuel in that until Samuel, you know, until this happened where, yeah, the people of Israel, they wanted a king. And of course, that we know wasn't a good thing, but it then would usher in a time period that was all about the kings and various kings would come and rule. And again, there we see that when godly righteous kings didn't come up and weren't leading the people the people fell into the sins of the bad leaders that they had and that was the reality and so with Deborah she used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim and the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment now the word for sit in this verse actually means that she dwelt and the original says that she dwelt within a palm grove wasn't just one little palm tree on a hill that she sat underneath. She actually dwelt in a palm grove that was all her own. She did not settle herself within the gates of the cities where judges traditionally sat. And there's a lot of people, you know, look at this and say, well, why didn't she? But it's very, very likely that, remember what I read to you earlier on? I told you that it was very dangerous and that the cities were actually deserted. The villages were deserted. And so it's very possible that it may be because of the social climate of the dangers within the cities and on the roadways that she actually settled herself in an area where she wasn't in a city but she was actually in this palm grove that was all her own and it was in a place where people could easily come up to her because it was a dangerous time so she settled on her own homeland and the people of israel would take the journey up towards the area where she had settled and remember they they went up it says they went up 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 to her for judgment but it was because physically she stayed in an area that was elevated geographically so geographically they would have to travel up high to get to her now like i said there were three specific titles that we find connected with deborah when we read judges four we've dealt with judge and we've dealt with prophetess but the other one says lapidot's wife this is something so interesting because the hebrew actually reads eshet lapidot and now the word eshet should actually be familiar to you it's found in the introduction of Proverbs 31 where we read it as the eshet chayil now eshet means woman and the word lapidot is actually a feminine hebrew word in its plural state and it means lights it means torches it means flames which are burning bright and together these two words mean woman of lamps or woman of lights or woman of flames or woman of fire and scholars actually should suggest that you know lapidot is very unusual because it's not usually a name of a person and the plural form then also misses the usual son of designation which was very very prevalent of course throughout ancient israel's genealogies we read it throughout the bible that would say you know isaac son of abraham or it would go like that everybody was identified through the patriarch that they were connected to and that was how it was and so this is missing here with lapidot and so it's very you know it's very sketchy because was Deborah married then? Because the word seemed to suggest otherwise some people say she wasn't. It was a title of honor. It's really, really debated. And you will have to decide because, uh, you know, for us, it's a great area in that we don't really know because we don't know Deborah. We're not living in her time. Words can say one thing 
words can say another thing and we just see that it does mean woman of light, woman of lamps, woman of fire, woman burning brightly. And the word seems to, to suggest to us that it's very, very possible that she wasn't married. And if it was just this title that was given, it would have been a title of honor. It would have been a distinction, a mark of character instead of merely saying, well, she was married. You know, it would have been a thing of this was who she was and this is what she embodied and this was how people actually saw her and that's so very interesting to note so if we move on we're going to look at now you know Deborah in the fact that she's now summoning Barak and this is very very important because we get a deeper look at actually who Deborah is here in Judges 4 6 to 8 and it says now she sent and summoned Barak the son of Abinon from Kadesh Naphtali and said to him has not Yahweh the God of Israel commanded Go and march to Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and from the sons of Zebulun. I will draw out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give him into your hand. Then Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. The people of Israel, they really see Deborah as the one that Yahweh chose to give them guidance and to enact judgment according to the Torah. Because within these very next verses right here, Deborah acts as the spokesperson that she is for the Most High. She's really fulfilling that role. Receiving the word from Yahweh, she summons Barak. She tells him, you know, let's deal with these oppressors. You know, Yahweh is saying, go and march with 10,000 men and Yahweh will give your enemies into your hands. She knows that this is the Father's will. She knows that Yahweh has spoken to her, that Yahweh has said it. She knows that this is our Father's will. She also knows, if we look at these words right here, if we look at them in the original, if we look at how they stated, she knows that Yahweh has already actually spoken to Barak, that Barak has heard Yahweh speaking before. Her words imply this. This is not the first time that Barak has heard Yahweh's call to go and destroy the enemy, to go up against Sisera. This is not the first time. Yet he seems to struggle with the same self-doubt that so many of the judges struggled with. He tarries, he waits, he now, you know, is sitting with this. But now everything has changed because Deborah himself, herself has summoned him and the people have heard, the prophet has spoken, he kind of shrink back, people are listening and someone else knows exactly what he is called to do as well as the spokesperson of Yahweh, the leader of the people, the judge at the time knows that he is supposed to do this. So he relents, he says, okay, I will go, but he says, I will not go you know, if you don't come with me. Now, he, he kind of shrinks, he can't shrink back from the call, but he gives sort of this ultimatum. He will only go into battle with someone who clearly, clearly can hear from Yahweh and who can give him the very best guidance on the battlefield. Now, many individuals actually assume that Barak was wrong in requesting Deborah's presence. And because of this, that that's the reason why he had the honor of defeating Sisera snatched away from him, because that's what happens, to, you know, Deborah says to him well you're not going about this thing the right way because of this you are not going to be the one that defeats Sisera physically you know you're not going to be the hand that lays that upon him so she she does say that to him you're not going about this in a good way and so again many people like I say believe that it is because he's requesting her presence that you know he gets this honest natural but the words actually very very differently imply something otherwise because in fact whenever the Israelites marched into battle the priests would accompany them with the ark the urim and the tumim would be there they would even go and they would request for a priest to use this urim and tumim which many people you know call magical or divine or whatever and they would use these things and that would divinely pronounce Yahweh's will so you know also when when the Israelites went into battle the warrior priests would go with them so it's not really wrong to want somebody who can clearly hear from Abba Father to go with you. So if that's not the problem, what 
is the problem. The problem here is not that Barak wants the prophetess to be with him. It is that he cannot seem to take Yahweh at his word. In fact, here, right here, we find in Judges 4, right right here in these verses, this is in fact one of the only promises that are given in the book of Judges where Yahweh chose to reveal the exact battle plan to Sisera before the war had even begun. Yahweh doesn't just say to Sisera, hey, I'm going to hand these people over to you. He doesn't just say, hey, hey, you know, uh, Barak, you're going to be super successful because everything's going to be fine. I've given you the victory. He doesn't just say, hey, it's going to be okay at the end. He actually speaks through a prophetess to go and speak to him and to tell him exactly how the battle's going to unfold. So, you know, Barak has been spoken to before by Yahweh, maybe in his personal quiet space. You know, he's heard he's heard God tell him, you are supposed to go and deal with the enemy. And he didn't. So he, you know, relaxed into that. And then here we have a prophetess calling him, telling him what's happening, telling him what he has to do and telling him the end from the beginning. And it's only right here with Yahweh chooses to reveal exactly what he's going to do and this is incredible because right here we see that God is not just promising victory but he's promising total annihilation of the 900 chariots of iron that everybody feared so greatly it's quite crazy to think about it like that 900 chariots of iron and of course it would be equivalent to something really intense today like if someone was coming against you with a nuclear arsenal and you had nothing but a sword in your hand you would also be quite scared but Jawi actually says that at the river Kishon, he will destroy the chariots. He tells, you know, he tells Barak that, but Barak still hesitates. The God of the universe actually tells him exactly what would happen, how it would happen. Yet the man still hesitates. It's incredible. So events then would change and Cicero would be given into the hands of Jael, a woman who did not hesitate. You see how different their responses are? Jael did not hesitate. She acted quickly. You know, we're not even told what her motivation was. We're not even told why she did what she did, but she acts so quickly and she takes the side of the people of Yahweh. So she acts really, really quickly to eradicate Israel's enemy. And so verses 11 to 13, again in Judges 5, the song of Deborah, it tells us that this is exactly what Yahweh did. He caused a sudden flood to come and to fill the Kishon River Valley. And because of this flood, the 900 chariots of iron and the soldiers were drowned in a watery grave. Now, it's not exactly the same as, you know, when Pharaoh cross over the river and all the chariots you know when the israelites crossed the red sea they got through it's not exactly the same because what happened is it says that barak killed ten thousand of the soldiers of the men by the sword because their chariots were literally stuck in the mud and everything happened just as yahweh said it would happen so what happened was yahweh brought this divine flood to move down the kishon river and apparently uh, this still happens today that the kishon river in israel can fill up really really quickly within a matter of minutes and people that are there if you're swimming or whatever people have drowned and so this does still happen today so it but it is a divine thing because Yahweh brings the water down at this exact moment where we have 900 chariots of iron pursuing Israel coming against them and they're riding fearlessly they are bloodthirsty because the people that they have cruelly oppressed and you know have treated so bad for 20 years is suddenly rising up It's like slaves, you know, rising up and there's this revolution and now they're totally going to take care of it. So they ride, they ride on these chariots of iron and they come against Israel and Yahweh brings this incredible flood. He promises here in Judges 4 that this is what would happen with at the river Kishon. And here we see that this is exactly what happened because Deborah and Barak sing this song in Judges 5 and they tell us that this is what happened. And so the water comes and it gets, you know, takes over these chariots. The chariots are destroyed. Barak can then go and he can kill all the soldiers that are there, which is what he does. But we also know that then Sisera runs away and Jael takes care of him. So everything happens exactly as Yahweh said it would happen, which is a glorious, glorious thing. But we need to remember that before this, Deborah did go with Barak into battle. And verse 9 and 10 actually repeat this in Judges 4. And it seems that she assumed this very same position that Moses had once assumed on the mountain 
overlooking the battle to clearing the battle as one and that is amazing and it's incredible and it's awesome because to add their steady marching they join near to engage Sisera in a heated battle Deborah was patiently and powerfully listening in for Yahweh's voice once she heard that voice she turned and she said the following to Barak arise for this is the day in which Yahweh has given Sisera into your hands Yahweh has gone out before you so Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him throughout the time period of the judges and this is what's also incredible about Deborah throughout the time period of the judges different tribes fought foreign oppressors and mostly single tribes fought together but only only once only in the battle of Deborah and Barak were six tribes united of Israel. Usually limited tribes would operate together, but so impassioned were the tribes of Israel to join under Deborah and Barak's leadership that they actually united together. And half of the tribes were fighting side by side and their unity was unmatched. This reality, you know, in itself for me is a huge testimony to the leadership and the respect that many had towards Deborah as a righteous, fierce, bold, humble leader of the Most High. People were, you know, nations, people and different tribes were oppressing Israel all the time. And so, yes, limited tribes would rise up and, you know, throw that yoke off of them and attack the people that were oppressing them. But yeah, we have half of the tribes of Israel, six of them uniting together underneath the leadership of this woman who has said, yes, we need to do this. This is God's will. And they're uniting under the leadership of Deborah and Barak and saying, yes, we are going going to be with you we are with you we are partakers and we're going to destroy the enemy and this is what they do and it's beautiful and it's a testimony like i said and i'm going to say it again this is a testimony to the leadership that yahweh raises up do not choose for yourself leaders that are after your own hearts do not choose for yourself leaders that are there because of their own hearts because they just want a place or a platform or position or leadership or a ministry like Korah. it's not about that it is is truly truly about knowing who Yahweh has called and whom Yahweh is going to use in this time because that's what's important with this kind of unity with this kind of leadership there will come great defeat of the enemy and our enemy we know is spiritual so we need super deep eyes to be able to see how to overcome this enemy now we need to, to just mention something here and I need to just mention this that Deborah, you know, she sings a very, very beautiful song in Judges 5. And now it's it's a complete song and it's commonly called the Song of Deborah. It's the oldest, it's the most complex form of poetry that's found in the Bible. And the purpose of her song, of course, is to tell the story. Now, history was always honored and handed down to us orally in the form of songs, in the form of poetry. And women did most of the retelling. And this is beautiful in the ancient Near East. We know that women did much of this retelling. They were the ones that would sing. They were the ones that were commanded to sing. They were the ones that took upon themselves that honor and people recognized them in that. And she really, really starts off her song in Judges 5, which we're not going to go into. I have actually done a full study on Deborah's song in Judges 5 in the video that I call the female psalmists in the scriptures. It's actually found on our YouTube channel. And it goes in depth into Judges 5 and Deborah's song, as well as four of the female psalmists that we find throughout the scriptures. And it's a very, very beautiful teaching. So I'm not going to go into Judges 5 today. But what I am going to say is that she does start off in Judges 5 by extolling the true hero of the story. Deborah is not taking any honor here for herself. She says at the very opening of this song, she says the warrior God, he marched into battle. He went before us. She exalts God through the opening five verses of the song. Not just in one verse, not just in a little passing by. She's saying that, hey, she paints the climate of the day. She paints the danger of the day. She paints the peril, the unoccupied villages, the forlorn, the broken, the deserted, you know, everything. Everything that's bad. And then she says, the warrior God marched before us. And then we have Judges 5 verse 7. And this is what I want to talk about. Because this is how Deborah saw herself. It said, and before we before we look at what I've actually just put up here, I'm going to just read this to you. It says, villages in Israel would not fight. They held back. 
until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose, a mother in Israel. Now, I speak a lot about this word arose. When we look at the words used in Proverbs 31, again, that teaching that I've done that's on our YouTube channel about Proverbs 31, this word we find throughout Proverbs 31, this word arose or arise, this word is so significant and it's so rich in its meaning. It is the Hebrew word kum and it means to arise from a sitting position, from a position in a place of prayer. This directive is actually found to us in Isaiah 61, which says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. Deborah is telling those that are listening to her song that these things things were bad. Like I said, the social climate was bad until prayer took place. Remember, it was from that place of prayer and it was from that place of receiving divine guidance from Yahweh that led her to call Barak. It was from a place of kneeling in that place of deep prayer, of being in that deep place to receive from Abba Father that she received from him and then called Barak. She heard this from a place of prayer and she arose to become a mother in Israel. That is what she's telling you. I was in this position of prayer and Abba Father spoke to me and then I arose. She uses this word arose twice because that shows you how deep she saw a place of prayer and intimacy and communion with God. As the speaking with him, being intimately with intimate with him it's not just about you know going into your room and closing your door and you know praying for half an hour it's about continuing communing with him and that's what she's doing she just continue is communicating with him and then she decided from what she heard and what the father told her to do her obedience was to call barak and commission him that was her obedience her obedience wasn't to lead the army into battle that's not what yahweh told her yahweh told her that you are to summon barak and you are to tell him that was what Yahweh said. And that is what we also need to be careful of in our own lives. Oftentimes, we want to interpret things the way we want to. We want to take a word and we want to self-fulfill it. We want to take a prophecy that we've you know, received and we want to interpret it in our own way. That is not what we are to do. If Yahweh says, you summon that person and you tell them to go, then all you do is summon because that's your obedience. And so she says that she rose a mother in Israel. Now, this is super significant because the word mother, of course, carried a very different meaning meaning in the ancient world and to understand what Deborah meant by assuming the role of mother to a nation we need to understand her perspective you see mother was seen as both a nurturer and a warrior they were considered leaders they were the originators of life both spiritually and naturally and they often acted as mother birds do and we find that beautiful picture actually in Deuteronomy 31 where you stir the young from the nest during times of complacency and Deborah really assumes the role of a nurturer of a nation that's strained, of a nation that's wanting, and her influence in this reality was so deeply felt, and it would last under 40 years, over 40 years, over 40 years under her guidance as judge. That is a very, very long time. Yahweh is gracious, He is kind, He is amazing. Because think about it 20 years. You know, two decades, 20 years, they were cruelly oppressed by Sisera and Jabin. And what does Yahweh do? Raises up a righteous leader who rules and helps and nurtures and is a warrior and is a spokesperson who is a judge for him for 40 years. So double the time that they were in this oppressed state, double the time he gives them a righteous leader and a time of joy and peace. And it's so beautiful to realize that. And so again, you know, she says, until I rose this mother in Israel. And so we see Judges 5 verse 12 says this, wake up, wake up, Deborah, wake up, wake up break out in song Deborah was stirred she was awakened by Yahweh to see truth and she was awakened to speak that truth to his chosen people and she truly completed that calling she was functioning fully in all the roles she grew in throughout her life and that is so beautiful because great leaders they are not born they choose to heed the calling of God upon their lives and they grow to become the people of influence they need to be who lead in boldness who lead in righteousness and she had the calling to talk to speak to proclaim to pronounce to command to promise and in every way her story and her song is really really a story about using our voice and I cannot say that enough it was her voice 
that Israel needed. It was the power of a godly woman's voice. Again, Yahweh spoke to her and she had to give these divine messages to the people. Her role in this way was often just to, you know, speak to the nation as well as that was the role of judge. They would sit there and they would have to really, really have wisdom and understanding and such deep discernment really to know because that's why Solomon prays that prayer to Yahweh when he's going to become king and when he's a very young king he says give me a wise and understanding heart so that i may hear and so that i may be able to judge your people because who can carry so great a nation and that is what solomon really prayed he wanted a wise and understanding heart so that he could know and enact judgment and we see you know right there where solomon prays that prayer it pleases yahweh and we see solomon actually in that role you know when he's sitting on his throne and he he has those two women that come to him those two prostitutes and then the one's baby is dead and the other one's alive and he has to have deep wisdom to know what's going on there we see him in that role because we also see that yahweh has blessed him with that wisdom the judges of old had to have the same kind of wisdom the in-depth wisdom and that was what deborah had she really embodied that and so when they had that wisdom they had to speak out the judgment and what they said was accepted very very different from what we have today you know when a godly leader rises up people often in the body are like stubborn sheep and they don't want to listen to what's happening and so deborah really embodies that and she just says this is yahweh's divine will and it's that power of that godly voice yet today you know women have been so silenced and this can only be a diabolical plan by the enemy of humankind because he truly understands better than we do the threat of a woman's voice now ancient israel in ancient times many many years ago they never had an issue with a woman leading them in a right relationship with god they recognized here deborah for who she was yes we have a very patriarchal society at that stage yes we have a lot of other examples of bad things that were happening to women i'm not saying that it was perfect for women i'm not saying that they empowered women more than today but in the specific case of deborah there was no reality of people kicking off her leadership it was that they recognized her specifically i'm referring to her specific case that she was a woman that was leading them into a right relationship with god they recognized who she was and they went up to hear wisdom from her they had no no problem with that and she really did she was the mother of israel and that's how she saw herself you know judges four and the writer of the book of judges tells us that she was prophetess lapidot's wife and judge but how did she really see herself and how what did she really say about herself she said until i rose as a mother the mother is the nurturer the warrior the one that you know gives a life and it's a beautiful beautiful picture and so i really want to encourage you today to consider what deborah's life says to you what all of the ways of the things that she did really speaks to you and if your heart is really touched by her and by her life by her legacy maybe it's one of your favorite scriptures maybe she's one of your favorite people or maybe you've never even thought about her until today or maybe you just feel like wow this is incredible what would it take for me to become someone like that then i truly believe that you are already on the pathway and you need to remember this that you are called for right now you are called for this generation there is no mistakes with yahweh you know deborah was born into her time period to fulfill a specific role and task in her time and in her generation and it's the same for us we are called in this generation the enemy has tried to silence the female voice because he knows and understands like i said better than we do what we are called to do and so today i really want to encourage you to be unsilenced use your voice for the kingdom of yahweh speak the word of yahweh speak as he commands you to pray for the sick pray for those who are broken pray and pray and pray intercede intervene evangelize do what he is calling you to do because you were born for such a time as this and you can go forward if you have a passion to encourage then you encourage with all your might it's just like you know paul says that if you're called to teach you teach with everything inside of you if you're called to prophesy you prophesy with everything inside of you whatever you're called to do you do it 100 and 50 percent and you give it your all and have a father will lead you don't let any human being on this planet tell you that you can't fulfill the divine calling that you are called to do only yahweh's opinion matters and i pray that if you're in that position that people will come alongside you who will support you and that will be with you in so many ways so before we end off today's teaching let's pray together father we just want to say thank you 
so much today that you are a mighty God and an awesome King. Father, as we look at your word, we see your kindness, we see your love, we see your mercy, and we see so much of your blessings. And Father, we just want to put our hands in the air right now and say that we surrender to you. We know that you are at work in our lives. We know that that we are called for a purpose. Father, we say fulfill your plan for our lives, fulfill your destiny for our lives, fulfill your calling for our lives. And I want to pray for every single woman that's listening right now, that Father, you will touch this woman's life, that you will touch her heart, that you will set her free, that she won't be silent, Father, but that she will be powerful in your kingdom, Father, that you'll bless her, that you'll keep her, that you'll make your face shine upon her, that you will challenge her, change her, inspire her, and just bless her abundantly. Father, I thank you so much for your word, which is truth and which is life to us. And we say thank you so much for all of this. Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray this in your mighty, mighty name. Amen. It's been so good to share this time with you. I really pray that you have really enjoyed this teaching. If you really know someone that needs to be inspired or that needs this, you know, testimony of Deborah's life, then go ahead and share this video with them. Go ahead and share or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Do not forget to subscribe for more teachings like this one. Go and look at the Proverbs 31 video. Go and look at the female psalmists in the scripture. Be encouraged by their lives and their stories. And again, you can go over to our website, treasuredinheritanceministry.com and you can get the notes for this teaching so that you can just go over it again in your own time or in your quiet time and so until next time it's been so great to be with you shalom shalom and blessings in messiah yeshua